Dear students, uh, good morning. Uh, the lecture of today is about infections by anaerobic bacteria. And first of all, we have some definitions, important definitions. And these are um, definitions um, are very important to make a distinction of them. For example, we have anaerobes and we have another term, the facultative anaerobes and aerobes. So what is the difference? Any idea? Do you know the difference between anaerobe and an aerobe or facultative anaerobe? If you still remember from your uh, first class as a medical student. Victor, the aerobe can only grow in the presence of oxygen. An aerobe die in the oxygen and facultative anaerobe uh, uh, facultative uh, can grow in the both oxygen and not oxygen okay thank you so that's correct so um, first of all uh, the anaerobes they uh, use the oxygen for growth and metabolism and uh, uh, and the oxygen here is not used by anaerobes, rather they go for fermentation. Um, and also, um, I would like to ask you a question. What is the importance of fermentation for microorganisms in general? Any idea? Why do microorganisms do fermentation? So what is the benefit and output of fermentation, if you still remember? This is just to refresh your information. To, uh, to, to difference between the type of all organisms, because all type and uh, same happen for Yes, but what is the importance? What is the significance for a microorganism to do fermentation? Why is it fermentation is important for microorganisms in general? What is the purpose that does fermentation serve for a bacterial cell? Why do bacterial cells in general do fermentation? Tehmir. Good question, right? <laughs> so fermentation is important. We know that, but why? What is the benefit of fermentation for a microorganism? Okay. Now, I would like to, in this lecture, to uh, this is the idea of this lecture, is to link the dots and to connect them and to make sense out of all the information that you had. And you may also uh, see this uh, something new for, for you. So uh, having information is good, but you have to connect the dots and make sense of them. And also uh, we are going to link all this basic information with the clinical practice as much as possible. So, um, so anaerobes, uh, they don't use oxygen, okay? But they go for fermentation. Actually, the main benefit of fermentation for a microorganism is to obtain energy. And what is the output uh, of fermentation? If you remember the ATP, okay? So ATP is the currency of energy. Huh? So um, the, and also here, I would like to emphasize or remind you that what is the output of one mole of glucose for after fermentation? If you remember the glycolysis, Okay, we have uh, also the uh, breakdown of glucose molecule, which is of uh, six carbons. It will, will give us at the end two ATP, right? And two ATP is the energy. So microorganisms do fermentation for the sake of to gain, to get the energy, the ATPs. And these ATPs are going to be used by the same microorganism for growth and other metabolic pathways. Okay, so you can see now the benefit and the appreciate the importance of the fermentation in general. Now, for anaerobes, this is the only way 
to get ATPs by doing fermentation, right? Now, in case of facultative anaerobes, as your colleague said, they can go for fermentation, but also they, can, they have the possibility to use oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor. And this pathway, which is called the oxidative phosphorylation, and this will enable the microorganism to get even higher amount of ATPs. And do you remember the number of ATPs that a bacterial cells or a yeast cell uh, can get from the um, breakdown of a one mole or uh, of a glucose? Do you remember the figure, the number? So this is 38 ATPs, okay, which is way higher than two ATPs. So you can now uh, see the difference between the oxidative uh, phosphorylation when oxygen is used and when oxygen is not used. So if oxygen is there and the microorganism is facultative, it means they can use that oxygen to get energy. So they will get 38 ATPs from a single glucose, a single a one mole of glucose. So this is good because more, it means more energy will be obtained if, ox if oxygen is there. But if oxygen is not there, then this same microorganism, the facultative, will be uh, 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 forced to go for the fermentative pathway, which produces less energy, okay? Now, for aerobes, they require oxygen, okay, as a terminal electron acceptor. And the obligate strict aerobes, they, uh, they cannot survive without the presence of oxygen. On the other hand, for anaerobes, we have the other, the, uh, the, the other uh, thing in the anaerobe is that they don't use oxygen in a normal case. They usually go for the fermentation. So this is the main importance. And also, uh, if you have anaerobic infection, now this is one of the modes of, an, of a treatment is to expose these anaerobes to oxygen. And we call that under high pressure, we call that hyperbaric oxygen. It means oxygen under high pressure. And this is one of the uh, uh, modes of a treatment for anaerobic infections. You expose these micro anaerobes uh, for the high pressure oxygen in order to kill them, okay? Uh, and there is another term also that's nice to know, which is called the capnophilic bacteria. Now these microorganisms, they require not oxygen, but carbon dioxide, CO2 for the growth. And the other thing also to know, very important, is that in, in any by infections, uh, by anaerobic bacteria that tend to be uh, polymicrobial infection. What do we mean by polymicrobial infection? Is that these are uh, different microorganisms, so a mixed infection. It can be characterized by the presence of anaerobes, facultative anaerobes, as well as aerobes. So uh, typically, in a closed, usually this will uh, be in a closed space. In a closed space, um, the oxygen there will be gradually consumed by aerobes and by facultative anaerobes because they are going to go for oxygen to get more energy. And as, as soon as the oxygen becomes very little or scarce or scarce in that space, then the micro, the facultative will uh, go for the fermentation pathway and the anaerobes will do the same as usual. So, um, so this is the uh, case in the uh, anaerobic infections. Usually they tend to be in closed spaces, okay? Now, the question is, why do anaerobes get killed by oxygen-free radicals? Why do these anaerobes are sensitive to the presence of oxygen? Because of the oxygen-free radicals. But what is the main reason? Why do these microorganisms cannot uh, tolerate 
the oxygen and the oxygen free radicals? Well, this is a very important question, and this is due to the lack of certain defense mechanisms. Now we have three different mechanisms. They are important to protect any microbial cell from oxygen and oxygen free radicals. And oxygen free radicals, they are toxic to the cell. They do insult uh, the cell. And the, these are highly reactive chemicals and they interfere with the metabolism and can lead to cell death. So these bacterial cells should be equipped you know, can be equipped by these different three mechanisms in order to counteract uh, the toxicity by oxygen-free radicals. And these, these mechanisms, first of all, is the presence of oxidase, oxidase enzyme, which is called the cytochrome system. And oxidase test is one of the tests to detect the presence of oxidase. So this is mechanism number one. And mechanism number two is by another enzyme, which is called superoxide dismutase, SOD for short. And this will, again, protect the cell from oxygen and its free radicals. The third mechanism is the enzyme that you are familiar with, is the catalase test, which detects the enzyme catalase. In catalase, the enzyme will also get rid of the uh, oxygen uh, free radicals like hydrogen peroxide, if you still remember from the test in the lab session, practical lab sessions, okay? And so these are the different three mechanisms that <clears throat> any microbial cells can use. But you, these different mechanisms are not present for every cell. So in, for example, this is very important. I would like to emphasize the fact that anaerobes, they do not have the cytochrome system. Okay, so whenever you read about anaerobe, uh, do remember, please don't make a mistake. They don't have cytochrome or ex any oxidase. But these anaerobes can have the other two enzymes. In this case, when these two enzymes are there in the anaerobes, they are, uh, these anaerobes, uh, they become tolerant to the oxygen to some extent. What I, what I mean by some extent at a certain pressure, but if you have an infection with uh, anaerobes that are tolerant to oxygen, if they are exposed to hyperbaric oxygen, therefore we use the hyperbaric under high pressure and for a treatment, then definitely these cells won't tolerate oxygen anymore under that high pressure. So they are going to get killed, to be killed by that oxygen. So uh, it's very okay uh, to know that, that the uh, anaerobes, they can tolerate oxygen, but for strict anaerobe, this is not possible. Any amount of oxygen will be toxic and will lead to cell death, okay? And uh, so the ability to tolerate oxygen is something variable from species to species and can even vary within a single or a given species. This is called strain to strain variation. So this is the basic thing. And uh, this is the, uh, let's say a background for the topic for the infections. Now in the print material, you are going to see in the lecture, some medically important anaerobes as a table. And um, here, we have uh, different, uh, this table, uh, this is uh, the, you can see here the gram stain, okay? And also you can see uh, the anatomical sites where these microorganisms usually exist. Okay. Let me do sharing again. Now, do you see? Okay, do you see now the table? Okay, good. So in this table, you see these microorganisms and uh, the anatomical site. And it's also, uh, these are the, me the medically important anaerobes, okay? 
So that's not all. It's not just a group of the medically important ones. Good. Now we have the uh, this one. We have the. Yeah, we have the uh, bacteroides fragilis group, bacteroides, okay? These are present in the colon and the mouth, and they constitute a large amount of all bacteria in the gut. They belong to the genus bacteroides alone, okay? So about 30%. So this is a very large group, the bacteroides. That's for it's put in the, at the head of the list, okay? And... Uh, um, they are can they, they can be involved in actually uh, different intra-abdominal infections and appendicitis, diverticulitis, and pelvic inflammatory diseases, and also ovarian abscesses. If you still remember from the last lecture, what do you what do you call this type of host microbe relationship? If you, this is a part of microbiota where it is involved in infections, like for example ovarian abscess. Do you remember what what do we call this type of relationship out of the three that you st if you still remember them? Okay, in the previous lecture we um, we mentioned three types of relationships: either utopia or atopia or dystopia. So, what do you think? Which one? Uh, this uh, uh, condition it can be here um, seen as what kind of relationship. If you see now, bacteroides involved in ovarian abscess. Any idea? Okay, now, um, the other thing is that uh, there is um, the, in the bacteroides also, it is associated with high mortality rate. And the, uh, uh, the ability of this microorganism to form abscess is actually due to its capsular polysaccharide, okay? And, uh, however, the clinical signs of fever and shock in case are not usually due to the presence of the antitoxin of the capsule, but rather due to the inflammatory immune response, okay? So this is one of the things to remember about bacteroides. It's a very important group, and they're part of microbiota. Okay, now we go to another uh, medically important anaerob or anaerobic infection, is due to the species or genus Fusobacterium. Under this genus, we have two species. One is called the Necroforum, and the other is the Nucleatum. The Necroforum um, usually is very pileomorphic. What is pileomorphic? Pileomorphic from the name pileo means multiple morphic morphology. So it means of this microorganism shows different morphologies, okay, different shapes under microscope. And they are uh, seen as long bacillus with round ends and tend to display bizarre forms exa when examined under microscope. Really, it is sometimes overlooked by physicians in infections. And this is very important in clinical practice. Whenever you see something with head and neck infection, and, and uh, usually the microbe is not uh, detected by uh, culture because uh, most labs, they don't use the anaerobic cultivation. And because in anaerobic cultivation, we usually use the anaerobic jar and conditions. And so this is not usually done by most of the labs. So therefore it can be easily uh, overlooked, okay? And uh, however, the uh, detection can be easily achieved using the microscope. If you use the microscope, they are going to see, you are going to see um, the uh, gram-negative bacilli uh, and uh, of different and bizarre, strange shapes, okay? And uh, the name of the disease is called the Limier's disease, okay? Limier's disease. 
And for example, here, uh, if you see in this uh, slide or image, so this is the uh, Fusobacterium necroforum. Okay, you see these uh, long threads. They are slender. They are pedomorphic, long, bacillus. Okay, and the round ends characteristics and uh, actually strange, very strange to see under microscope. So once you see this thing, then this is Fusobacterium uh, necroforum, okay? Now, uh, the other thing is to remember uh, is that usually a necroforum is not part, the species necroforum is not part of the normal flora. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the other species nucle nucleatum is part of the normal flora and, however, can be involved in pleuropulmonary obstetric infections and also brain abscesses or even periodontal disease. Periodontal means it's of dental procedures. Okay, so what do we call this again in the host microbe relationship context? If you see a number of microbiota involved in um, a certain infection, like for example here, what do you, if you still remember from the previous lecture, which I said is very important to understand the host microbe relationship and the microbial diseases? Okay, now we go to uh, <clears throat> another <clears throat> anaerobic infection, <clears throat> which is actually called, sorry, <clears throat> bacterial vaginosis. Now, the term vaginosis, if you just notice that it is vaginosis, it is not vaginitis. What's the difference between vaginitis and vaginitis? Whenever you see vaginitis, with itis uh, at the end, it implicates the presence of inflammatory cells. And since we don't have inflammatory cells, therefore it is called vaginosis, okay? There is no itis at the end. And uh, usually this condition, uh, this is here, uh, is caused by the uh, different microorganisms. Here in this condition, bacterial vaginosis, we see different or gram variable cells, okay? So there is no one single uh, species to be involved. Now, how to detect or to uh, recognize this condition? This can be easily recognized by you by seeing the clue cells, clue cells. A clue, it means like a hint or a clue for the examiner that something uh, related to vaginosis here. So therefore it's called clue cells. Whenever you see these cells under microscope, then most likely you are dealing with bacterial vaginosis BV for short, okay? Now, let me show you this uh, clue cells. Now, these are the clue cells. Uh, so the one at the uh, left, okay, you see here, here, this is normal, so normal vaginal cells. They are just sitting there and I seen here as epithelial cells. So this is normal. Now the clue cells, these are vaginal epithelial cells, but covered with uh, gram variable microorganisms, with many of them. So whenever you see this thing, just the clue cells, then it indicates the presence of bacterial vaginosis, this condition. And usually characterized by presence of many anaerobes, okay, so many anaerobes, in addition to Gardnerella vaginalosis, also another bacteria involved. It's also characterized by uh, an absence of other causes of vaginitis, like trichomonas, like trichomonas vaginalis, or um, mycotic infections. So in the vaginitis, you are going to see these uh, trichomonas or yeast and mycotic infections, but in vaginosis, usually bacterial. Therefore, it's called bacterial vaginosis and usually uh, presented with a large amount of unpleasant fishy discharge. And the pH, what do you think? The pH would be higher 
or lower than usual. Dr. Lawar? The pH, the normal pH of the vagina is 4.5, below 4.5, okay? So because this is the normal, now a, the deviation from that normal, so should be higher, higher than 4.5. And if the pH is higher than 4.5, what does that mean? This means that the environment is changed. And what do we call this from the previous lecture, host microbe relationship, when the environment is not suitable anymore for microorganism? What kind of relationship is this? What kind of diseases will lead that to? Is it utopia? No, because utopia is the normal environment, is the normal thing. Is it dystopia or atopia? So it's a condition of a dystopia, or it's a dystopic situation where the microorganism is not present in the normal environment as it used to be. And the new normal environment is part of the environment is the pH. If the pH is altered, then the environment would be not suitable. So therefore, this will lead to a con different medical conditions. Okay, and bacterial vaginosis, BV, is one of them. Okay, and also um, uh, don't uh, forget that these uh, epithelial cells are usually associated with also gram or anaerobic. Now this is um, a real image under microscope. So here you see the clue cell. This is a large epithelial cell and covered by a large number of microbes. And these are gram variables. Some of them are gram negative, some gram positive, and many of them or any ropes, okay? So I hope now this is, uh, this becomes very clear to you, okay? Now, we go back to our table. Now, what else? We have uh, under, we have another uh, example of medically important anaerobic infection due to the genus actinomyces. And the condition is called actinomycosis. In actinomycosis, we have two species, medically important. One of them is called actinomyces israelii, and the other is called actinomyces garnicerii. Okay, and both of, both of them are involved in the actinomycosis cases. This actinomycosis can be present, they have different presentations. And these presentations all, what is common, is the um, presence of the actinomyces, and these microorganisms are usually anaerobic, and they appear pileomorphic again on the brown stain. Uh, what do I mean by pileomorphic? Di they show different shapes, different morphologies. They can be short and club-shaped or long, thin, beaded filaments, okay? But very characteristic is the presence of the filaments, okay? And uh, they... Uh, they need to be differentiated from another similar filamentous uh, microorganism, which is called nocardia, okay? Uh, because nocardia is a different clinical entity and different uh, infection than actinomycosis. However, the causative microorganisms, they can also be uh, filamentous, showing filaments. So actinomycosis is a chronic, suppurative, and granulomatous infection that produces biogenic lesions with interconnecting sinus tracts that contain granules which are characteristic and important for diagnosis of this condition. And these granules, they, we call, these, call them the sulfur granules. Sulfur granules, these are hard, lobulated, and composed of tissue as well as bacterial filaments, which are club-shaped at the periphery. Now let me show you these granules. Now, this a condition, for example, by the way, actinomycosis can be presented uh, dif uh, differently whenever it depends on the presence of these infections or granules. If it is in the face or the neck, we call it cervicofacial. If it is in the chest, thoracic, it can also be abdominal or genital actinomycosis. Now, this one is obvious to be cervicofacial. 
Now, this is uh, the, uh, one of the causative agents, which is called here the actinomyces israelii. And you can see here the filamentous and here beaded, very slender, gram-positive microorganism, which is again anaerobic infection. Now, this granule is the sulfur granule, which is very characteristic and it is diagnostic. Whenever seen under microscope, then this is actinomycosis. Okay, as you can see here from this slide, you see the club shape appearance at the periphery, and this is these um, uh, the uh, this all the whole thing is a sulfur a sulfur granule single one, and usually composed of tissue and bacterial filaments. If you can see here the dark the purple filaments, these are the microorganisms, okay, embedded within the tissue. So this is very characteristic. Whenever you see this thing, again, it is characteristic. Now, genital actinomycosis in females can result from colonization of intrauterine contraceptive device. So again, what do we call this as a host microbe relationship? By the way, the actinomyces are part of a normal uh, or a part of normal microbiota but they can be involved in diseases. If we, so what do we call this as host microbe relationship? You can, every infection in microbiology, you can uh, assign uh, one of the three different host microbe relationships to it. Once you see or read about the uh, uh, specific details of that infection. Now, uh, as a part of a normal flora, but then all of a sudden it becomes part of infection due to the presence of intrauterine contraceptive device, the IUCD. So this is change of environment. So what do we call this type of relationship? What kind of a disease this? Uh, dystopia, doctor. Dystopia, exactly. Thank you. Okay. So now you get the point. Now uh, we go back to our lecture or to our um, table. Now you see uh, again also another example is now we have uh, mentioned the actinomyces as, as they are part of the oral microbiota, but also uh, can be seen. Now lactobacillus, the lactobacillus is, is a, a very important microbiota uh, because they maintain the pH of the vagina. If you are going to treat lactobacillus or eradicate lactobacillus, say, for example, using soap or detergents or antimicrobials, whatever, and then you get these microbes eradicated, now the pH will be changed. This will do what? This will elevate the pH. And once the pH is altered or changed, then we expect another disease to emerge from that. And this condition, we call it what? According to the host microbe relationship. If you eradicate microbiota and you see some diseases emerging out of this uh, treatment, what do we call these diseases? What kind of relationship now? Now, we call this atopia, okay? And by the way, the diseases resulting from atopia is totally different from those re resulting from dystopia, even with the same single microorganisms. Good. Now, uh, we go to another microbe, which is uh, gram-positive bacillus, which is called the Clostridium. And I'm sure that you... Uh, that you uh, also had a lecture about the Clostridium. And uh, now we have different Clostridia here and this table, it's uh, summarizing, it's a very important table to summarize the different Clostridium tetanus, the disease, and we have the toxin involved and some nodes. So in case of the tetanus, we have the tetanus spasmin, it's a neurotoxin which usually in, uh, lead to, uh, will compromise the inhibitory signals of the neurons leading or left with the positive uh, and uh, stimulatory ones, leading to rigid spasms and tonic state, okay? 
And the botulinum, uh, usually it's called uh, the disease botulism, it's a food poisoning. And the, however, the uh, paralysis here is not tonic or spastic, but flaccid, okay? And flaccid chinumanate. Axial takallus and besat, okay? So we have here uh, uh, another one is Clostridium perfringens, which is responsible for gas gangrene. By the way, what is called gas gangrene? Because of presence of gas. And usually it's present in a closed space. Again, in a closed space, we have anaerobic infections. Usually, don't forget, they present in closed spaces as polymicrobial infections. And their one responsible toxin is called lecithinase, usually by which contamination. And also another uh, disease is the food poisoning by enterotoxin and food poisoning within eight to 24 hours. Now, finally, we have Clostridium difficile, which is causing uh, the pseudomembranous colitis. And uh, usually it is called by the enterotoxin of A, B model, A and B, okay, subunits. Now, in this slide, you are going to, you are, you, as you see here, this is the Clostridium tetany, and they can get an access to the body, to the systemic circulation uh, from a minor injury, for example, and this will uh, ascend to, to, through the blood vessels or neurons to the brain stem or the spinal cord and will affect the inhibitory neurons. And then we have a state of stimulatory uh, condition that can manifest itself as in the face, which is a space a spasm of the jaw and the facial and neck muscles, which is called trismus or locked jaw, and also the rhesus sardonicus. And also, the, uh, this is the case of rhesus sardonicus, okay? And also you can see here the complete titanic spasm of the whole body in advanced disease and which can also uh, can be aggravated uh, with time and uh, finally leading to respiratory arrest leading to death okay and treatment is usually not to treat the microorganism itself but the toxin by right? the antitoxin okay titanus toxin now, in this image, you see the, uh, um, the gas gangrene, which is called by which microorganism? The Clostridium perfringens, okay? And this uh, uh, here, I'd like to show you here in this image that you can see here this, this one. This one is a bulging of the skin, and this bulging of the skin is due to the presence of, ox uh, of the gases inside. And these gases are actually the product of fermentation. And why fermentation? Because oxygen had already been consumed uh, at the very beginning by aerobes and whatever facultative anaerobes there. But then the mode of energy, uh, of energy, obtaining energy will be shifted to the fermentative pathway. This pathway will, uh, result, will result into the liberation of different gases. And these gases will do the, uh, con cause this uh, bulging. If you are uh, in surgery sessions in the future, you are going to do what is called the um, clinical examination of diabetic food, for example, or gas gangrene. And gas gangrene, uh, and gas gangrene uh, can be detected by the hand if you do some um, examination underhand. This is called crepitus. Crepitus is the gas felt and sound, uh, cracking sound that is felt under your hand when you are doing the examination, which indicates the presence of oxygen due to this anaerobic infection. Now, for any, uh, so this is uh, also important uh, for diagnosis. And also, what other signs important for diagnosis? Uh, so these are, uh, the following signs are important and suggestive of anaerobic infection. First of all, we you may uh, encounter foul smelling, okay? And this is caused usually by short chain fatty acids. Another thing, another sign is the infection in proximity to mucosal surface. And we call this condition the dystopia, okay? And the other thing is the gas in the tissues, as you can see here in this case. 
okay? Uh, this is in the crypitas, okay? This is a crypitas. You are going to detect gases. And this is usually CO2 or H2. And also, uh, in the lab, you are going to get negative results. Actually, it's not negative, but because the labs, they don't uh, perform the anaerobic cultivation properly using anaerobic jar. So therefore, they are going to tell you that's negative. Actually, it's not negative. And the, because they didn't do it right, so they will report negative culture results. However, this is a uh, this is can be considered as one of the signs that you may have an aerobic infection, most likely. Good. So these are the signs uh, of anaerobic infections, usually in closed spaces. And the treatment also is very important to remember as a physician or a, or a medical staff in the, in the future that treatment is best achieved by surgical drainage okay, of the contents inside this closed space. So as soon as, as long as this space remains closed, then the antibiotic uh, won't do uh, too much, okay? They don't do any benefit unless you do opening and surgical opening and drainage. You drain the contents of the plus inside, and then you, and plus you administer antimicrobial therapy. And the most effective drugs against anaerobic infections are usually clindamycin and metronidazole. And clindamycin is usually involved in antibiotic uh, implicated in because of the clindamycin, uh, whenever used, uh, usually it leads to another condition called the pseudomembranous colitis by Clostridium difficile. And this condition in host uh, microbe relationship. What do we call this, by the way, in host microbe relationship? When you administer clindamycin and you are going to, the one of the possibilities as a side effect you are going to have pseudomembranous colitis. So what do we call pseudomembranous colitis in this case? What kind of relationship now? So this one is atopia, okay? And the um, clindamycin, however, therefore, is, a prevent, is preferred in, for infections above the diaphragm not below the diaphragm because of this side effect. And uh, mitronidazole is preferred for infections below the diaphragm, okay? So we use mitronidazole instead in order to avoid having pseudomembranous colitis. So now we come to the end of the lecture. Thank you for listening. And uh, ah, this one is the, uh, if you go shopping and you see some cans bulging like this, so please uh, do remember that these may contain some anaerobic infection inside. So don't go and take this one. So change that uh, as soon as possible because this could be very well containing anaerobic infection, okay? Because of the gases inside. So now we come to the end. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, welcome to دكتور عفوا من نقول مثلا على البكتيريا مثلا الهابيتوال سايت او الاناتوميكال سايت ونذكر شيء متعلق بداخل جسم الانسان يعني هاي شرط انه تكون نورمال الميكروبيوتا yes so uh, the uh, the case uh, when you have uh, during when whenever you see anatomical site and the microorganism uh, is present there and it's part of a normal microbiota there Okay, now these microorganisms, although they are normally there, but they can be implicated in infections. So uh, this is either because of the atopia or dystopia. If they are involved in, yes, in uh, conditions uh, where environment is changed, um, then this is dystopia. Or if they are uh, emerging because of eradication, then this is atopia. And by the way, there is another term for this. This usually, for example, nectinomyces. It is called endogenous infection. What is endogenous infection? Uh, it is this that we just mentioned. It is when the microbiota now is involved in a clinical condition or a, or a disease or infection. Okay? So we call this endogenous and to differentiate that from exogenous. 
from outside the body. If the causative agent from inside the body, then this is endogenous. إيه دكتور واضح قصدي يعني احتمال عادي مثلا انه مايكروبايوتا عندنا احنا داخل الجسم مثلا yes. وهي مو بالديزيز اللي تكون اكزوجينس يعني مو مال الداخل هي السبب يعني الموجوده هي هم بالانفايرمنت مثلا ان دوينج اوف كاثيتر او اني ثينج يعني yes. ممكن يصير من الديزيز يعني فنقول عليها اكزوجينس هي عادي انه نورمال فلورا اللي موجوده جت لان السبب من الانفايرمنت فنقول عليها اكزوجينس هل قصدك هذا؟ يس اف ذا مايكرو اورجانزم از نوت does not belong to the microbiota, then this is mostly exogenous, okay? If the microorganism is part of microbiota and now is uh, responsible for a disease or for infection for whatever reason, then we call this endogenous infection. عفوا دكتور مو هذا قصدي يعني هسه مثلا اذا احنا عندنا نورمال فلورا وصار عندنا ديزيز متعلق بهاي البكتيريا اللي هي بارت من النورمال فلورا لكن السورس مالتها هو مو اندوجينس يعني لان هي مثلا هم موجوده بالانفايرمنت. No, usually the usual case is that the one responsible for that nearby anatomical site is usually from a microbiota in the neighbor site, okay? But if it is from exogenous, then it is exogenous. But mostly, mostly, for example, in pelvic infections or peritoneal infections, usually these microbes are part of normal flora in the large intestine but because of a rupture or an injury during the surgery or some foreign bodies, then you are going to see these microorganisms infecting the peritoneal uh, covering and peritoneal membrane, then this is what? This is endogenous, okay? From inside the body leading to infection. Thank you. You're welcome.